Hi, I'm David Dodge. Welcome to Green Energy Futures. Alberta is literally blessed with an abundance of non-renewable resources and among the very best renewable energy resources in the form of wind and solar. Thanks to populist politics, though, some people seem to think you must choose between oil and gas or clean energy. But demand for oil and gas is projected to decline. An investment in clean energy, green buildings, and electric cars is projected to soar to over $100 trillion. And there are a plethora of global factors that are going to determine the potential of these resources to create a thriving economy in the future, most of which are beyond our control. By analyzing these political, economic, and technical trends, the Pemina Institute has come up with Alberta's Roadmap to the New Energy Economy. We're pleased to welcome one of the authors of that report to discuss how Alberta can build a thriving role in the emerging new energy economy. All right. Hi, Dave. My name's Simon Dyer. I'm Deputy Executive Director of the Pembina Institute based in Edmonton. Great, Simon. You guys just came out with a report not too long ago about uh, uh, Alberta's pathways to uh, a low carbon energy future. What At the highest level, what's the report about? Right, the, uh, the Alberta Roadmap to a New Energy Economy. I think it's just trying to harness all the information that uh, shows that uh, you know there's a real energy transformation taking place around the world, and this has huge uh, impacts and benefits for Alberta. And I just don't think uh, most Albertans really realize how quickly things are changing, and we wanted to just provide a whole boat, bunch of context about how exciting those changes actually are and how a new government in Alberta could harness that uh, change with the right kind of policies uh, across the province to support uh, that, that transformation. You're making these uh, recommendations, assuming that a government might actually be interested in this. And there's a number of key things that we need to do. And the first one says we need a credible climate plan. Uh, I'm assuming that means we don't have one. So <laughs> what's wrong with the one we have and what do we need? That's right. When we released this report in February, the government of Alberta uh, did not have a climate plan and looked like a real sort of outlier when you compare across the country. The federal government has made a commitment to net zero. Um, our biggest cities, Edmonton and Calgary, have made a commitment to net zero. Uh, most international companies, many of the oil sands companies operating in Alberta, have all, have all committed to the fact we need to reduce emissions and get to net zero by 2050. So, yeah, the Alberta government was a real outlier in terms of not having a plan. Last month, the government of Alberta, just prior to the election, did uh, release uh, an emissions reduction plan, but it was it was pretty thin. It didn't actually include short-term commitments to reduce emissions. It made an aspirational commitment to net zero, which I guess is uh, is progress. But it was it was pretty vague, and there's just you know there's a lot of work for um, the government of Alberta to, to 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 catch up in terms of the mainstream on these issues. So this is really important, not just because climate change is important, but it's also important to our economic future, isn't it? And so one other context is this is happening around the world. So a lot of countries are doing this. How many countries are doing this as well? Yeah, well, I mean, 190 plus countries are signatories of the Paris uh, Agreement and uh, more and more uh, countries are making commitments to net zero. And uh, I mean, there's a, there's a technological revolution taking place, renewable energy is now the lowest cost uh, form of new electricity supply. We're seeing, you know, uh, exceeding all expectations in terms of the rate of deployment of uh, electric uh, vehicles, massive breakthroughs in terms of how we heat our homes and, you know, heat, heat pumps, all the things that you've been talking about for, for 20 years, uh, um, David, are now, you know, exceeding our wildest dreams in terms of rate of deployment. And in Alberta, it seems that, you know, the conversation about how to sort of harness that hasn't really sort of made it into the sort of provincial mainstream yet. There's also a couple of global contexts. You mentioned the uh, you mentioned other countries moving towards these goals, which will obviously affect what people invest in and, and how future what our future economies will look like. But there's a number of other realities in the global uh, uh, context right now that also affect us, you know, with respect to oil demand and and perhaps initiatives like the uh, like in the US. What are a couple other things that we should be paying attention to if we're going to actually plot a successful plan for our economy? 
Absolutely. Global oil demand is in decline. Uh, most oil companies that do these kinds of projections are starting to suggest we're going to see peak oil demand globally somewhere between 2025 and 2030. That's just around the, the corner. That's under business as usual. If we continue to see acceleration in technology and uh, continued policy change, it's going to happen even faster. So this is, uh, this is a context we've never seen before. And Alberta, as a you know, big producer of oil and gas, if we're smart and we want to still play in that what is going to be a declining market, we better make sure that we have a, a low cost and low carbon product. So rather than the way you know, some, you know, climate policy is often framed as uh, you know, some, something like an attack on the oil and gas industry, it's actually the opposite. Our only way to compete as an international player on oil and gas is dependent on our ability to reduce emissions and reduce emissions very uh, quickly. So, I mean, obviously that's the oil demand side of things, but on the other side, uh, expectations for growth in renewable energy uh, exceed any expectations we've seen before. I mean, the good news is Alberta is, uh, has the best resources in Canada for wind and solar. Uh, you know, we're seeing huge uh, deployment uh, through private procurement of uh, renewable energy, and those kinds of uh, trends should be encouraged and will continue. Uh, let's get to the benefits in a second and and what are the opportunities of uh, of actually planning for this change and, and existing in the context of this change. Uh, but Alberta does face a number of really big challenges in terms of emissions. Give me some stats about where it's at here. Like, what is the challenge we're facing? How much do we contribute? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's both a challenge and an opportunity, but uh, I mean, it's no surprise uh, Alberta is the source, the biggest source of uh, emissions provincially in the country. 38% of Canada's emissions come uh, from Alberta, so therefore Alberta has to be, uh, you know, 40% of both the solution and is, is the issue that needs to be uh, solved. I mean, uh, Many countries around the world and uh, and Canada as part of the Paris Agreement committed to reduce emissions 40 to 45 percent below 2005 levels by 2030. Alberta's emissions are uh, 8 percent higher, so we're going in the wrong direction. So it's uh, you know it's just it's just math. Um, Alberta is not doing its fair share and really needs to show up as a as a real partner in terms of uh, working with the rest of Canada and all other provinces and uh, municipalities in reducing reducing emissions. And there hasn't been a clear commitment yet in uh, Alberta that we see ourselves as part of the solution and a willing a willing partner in 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 doing our share. So Canada's or sorry, Alberta's almost forty percent of our national emissions. Uh, what are the top three or four boxes in Alberta, just for the record, uh, where our emissions are coming from? Yeah, I mean, oil, of ga oil and gas, of course, and particularly uh, growth in the oil sands is a, is a concern, so we need to reduce emissions uh, there. Uh, electricity is a big source of emissions in, uh, in, in, in Alberta. You know, we've made really good progress in terms of phasing out uh, coal, and, you know, um, Alberta is going to completely phase out coal by the end of 2023, many years uh, ahead of the schedule based on, you know, good good policy movement there a few years ago but we still have a relatively dirty grid compared to the rest of the the, the country uh you know and there's a lot of uh, emissions associated with the burning of natural gas so clearly cleaning up the you know, electricity supply is uh is is critical and then of course you get into issues around buildings and uh transportation and huge opportunities to reduce emissions in those sectors too we're going to circle back on a couple of those things, but first, uh, there's also a couple other trends that you know we really need to be paying attention to. Even Albertans apparently are interested in EVs, for example, which obviously affects uh, all of the big boxes you just talked about in terms of electricity, in terms of oil and gas. Uh, what's the aspiration there? What, what are we hearing about that? Yeah, and as Albertans, you know, we're sort of being uh, cheated out of the opportunity to purchase uh, electric vehicles. There's a shortage uh, of electric vehicles across the country. I know anyone who's had these sort of conversations with their neighbours, there's this real strong interest to purchase electric uh, vehicles and there isn't supply there, which I think suggests, that, suggests how manufacturers uh, misjudge the demand. And the supply that is available is actually going to jurisdictions that actually have targets, uh, legally binding targets to, to sell electric vehicles. So um, uh, manufacturers are, you know, are, are diverting their sales to, towards British Columbia and Quebec and, uh, and to a lesser extent, Ontario. So yeah, without rules in place that uh, 
would require uh, manufacturers to sell a share of those electric vehicles in Alberta. We tend to be uh, missing out here. I know uh, you're aware of some of the stats like the planned and projected investments in clean energy are staggering. Uh, you know, I've heard numbers of 110 billion, a trillion uh, between now and 2050. And, and obviously, that's going to be a big part of the future global economy. Uh, but we're not actually that bad at doing that stuff. We're just not really encouraging it or doing anything to really take advantage of it, are we? So what what are some of the big opportunity areas for Alberta to flourish? Yeah, and I mean, the point you made there, I mean, uh, smart governments always make uh, uh, investments and and bets in areas of growing industrial policy, right? You know, you know there's sometimes this myth that the market will uh, will decide and, you know, we get the, the industries that uh, the market provides for us. But of course, you know, the oil sands in, uh, in Alberta are a creature of government. They were cultivated over decades with billions of dollars of investment uh, by the provincial and federal government to give us the industry we have uh, today. So by the same token, uh, um, both federal and provincial governments should make uh, strategic investments in growing industries. And yeah, phenomenal op opportunities, as I mentioned before. I mean, a big one is uh, greening our electricity supply. Um, if uh, uh, we're going to reduce uh, emissions and uh, and and make progress. We need to use way more electricity in in Alberta and actually displace uh, many of the uh, the functions where we're currently burning fossil fuels. And that electricity needs to be uh, clean. So we need a you know there's huge opportunities for a build out of good clean renewable uh, electricity. And you're seeing these kinds of uh, um, phenomenal size uh, projects and the economic benefits that come come with those across southern Alberta. We're going to need transmission lines to uh, tie that together, both within the, the, the province and across provincial uh, uh, boundaries, to move those electrons in the same way that we move oil and gas with with pipelines uh, currently. Uh, phenomenal sort of untapped opportunity to uh, uh, to reduce um, emissions in buildings. Of course, you know our our cities have got some interesting programs to support. Uh, uh, homeowners to, to to make some of those um, investments, but the, we really have to, you know, move this upper level and start looking at uh, uh, multi-unit residential buildings, uh, low-income uh, housing opportunities for, you know, change at scale. You know, and uh, we we need the provincial government to play in that space where they haven't really been uh, active currently. And there are actually phenomenal opportunities in the oil and gas uh, industry. You know, even in a de declining oil and gas market, we're still going to use oil and gas, but that needs to be as clean as possible. There are phenomenal opportunities to reduce uh, in, um, uh, emissions of methane in the uh, commercial oil and gas sector, and reducing those emissions uh, um, creates jobs and uses uh, Canadian technology. So it's a it's a win win opportunity. So you're not saying, like these issues, it really drives me crazy when they're positioned as either or. So we stop all oil and gas today, or we don't. <laughs> you know, we invest in renewable energy, or we don't. And really, that's not how anything ever works out in the world. And we're going to need a lot of fossil fuels to get through even the most aggressive energy transitions. But Alberta has a challenge that, you know, in view of what you just said, uh, in particular, in making sure that those fossil fuels, even through the transition, are competitive. What What's the challenge there? Yeah, well, again, it's... Uh... Sometimes it seems that whether it's intentional or, or, or not, but uh, people get defensive when, uh, you know, the, the obvious is pointed out that, uh, you know, Canada's uh, oil resources, because, you know, we're seeing significant growth from bitumen in the oil sands, is a high intensity barrel of oil from a global perspective, third or fourth most uh, intensive uh, country in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Again, uh, Canada has uh, strong rules governing many aspects of uh, oil and gas, but we are a high carbon barrel and we need to drive that uh, down. And that needs to happen through strong regulations that will uh, eliminate methane, that will actually um, force companies to, to make the investments in carbon capture and storage that they say they're uh, you know, uh, willing to do. We've got to move past talk and actually talk about uh, 
deployment of, uh, of technologies to reduce emissions. And, uh, you know, Pemina has done a lot of work saying the, uh, the ball is in the court of industry. They say uh, they're committed to reduce emissions. We actually need to see those investments. And the investments we're talking about is, you know, we need to see on the order of, you know, $30 billion of investments from the oil and gas companies. And the question is, if they believe in, those, in their product, they need to make those investments. And I think, uh, you know, that's going to generate uh, jobs and revenue, of course, as well. Yeah, the CCS story always seems to be, we will do CCS someday. Yeah, well, I, I, and I think the conversation now is rapidly moving to uh, uh, who should pay for it. And clearly there is, uh, you know, um, there, there are good policies in place. We have industrial carbon pricing. Uh, the federal government has introduced investment tax credits for companies. And now it's up to the companies to uh invest in reducing their pollution it's completely unpalatable and unreasonable to expect that uh either provincial or federal taxpayers should pay these profitable oil sands companies to reduce their oil and gas their emissions they need to make those investments uh now and i think you know um i'm confident they can but their credibility is being seen as part of the solution is dependent on them committing to actually reduce emissions you cover quite a bit of this, and it's a pretty interesting uh, document. I'm sure a lot of people would be interested in actually having a look at because it, it does kind of lay all the issues out in, in a pretty easy to understand way. It's kind of an interesting report. What are the key five, six recommendations that come out of this in your report? Yeah, well, thanks, Dave. Yeah, you're right. Um, energy and climate is a, is a complex space and people's eyes sometimes glaze over when we're talking about these kinds of issues, but we really wanted to just frame that there is a, there are substantial economic opportunities here and we don't have to be scared about uh, putting rules in place that will actually encourage growth in all of those. And uh, I mean, obviously uh, continuing to future proof our oil and gas industry to make it competitive by um, requiring it to make the emissions reductions and reductions in methane are critical. Uh, moving forward to a uh, net zero grid by 2035, absolutely achievable, and you know the single uh, simplest way we can uh, reduce emissions in the in the in the short term. Uh, um, investing in active transportation and uh, the deployment of electric vehicles, be it through charging opportunities or through uh, incentives so uh, or rules so uh, manufacturers are incented to sell those vehicles uh, um, in Alberta which Albertans want to to buy you know massive opportunity for retrofits of uh, of, of buildings and then we also include a few uh, recommendations uh, around other issues which are of importance to uh, um, uh, Albertans of course things like uh, uh, ensuring we don't um, have coal mines on the eastern slopes, strong land use planning and protection of uh, protection of uh, nature and uh, oil and gas liability. I mean, when we wrote this report, these issues hadn't uh, erupted again, but clearly, I mean, uh, uh, one of the biggest liabilities and financial issues facing Alberta is this massive uh, unfunded liability from oil and gas uh, infrastructure. And there's like one last opportunity here to ensure that the polluter pays and uh, Albertans aren't left saddled with the, the cleanup costs associated with that. I just want to back up uh, just for, on one item because it's my one of my favorites. It's your second biggest bar and that's electricity. Uh, you know, Alberta, it's really funny because Alberta is the best at this already. We don't support it. We don't celebrate it. We don't do anything in any way, shape or form that, as far as I can see to really nurture this along. It's just kind of a happy coincidence that we have good policies that are supporting this and a great resource. But it's kind of a mixed bag, isn't it? Like, so we, we got rid of coal in, in perhaps the most aggressive way of perhaps almost any jurisdiction. Amazing achievement, <laughs> you know, like amazing emissions reductions. The problem is we replaced a lot of it with natural gas, which is going to have a limited shelf life in terms of emissions unless CCS becomes a lot cheaper. There's just other ways of doing it. We have this amazing renewable energy resource. So how do we get past, how do we do the best thing here? How do we be strategic, get rid of those emissions and have a great economy given the context of our electricity grid, which actually you know, what I'm trying to say is not as big a challenge as you might think. Yeah, I mean, we have to take the urgent short term view, but we also have to take the long term view, right? So which is that we need net zero emissions in less than 25 years. So we shouldn't be building anything today that is not viable in uh, 
in a 2050 future. And you know, uh, gas plants have a life of more than 20 years. So we shouldn't be building unabated gas plants now. We're gonna be exactly the same situation we are with coal is that we're gonna be phasing out uh, uh, plants that we probably shouldn't have built in the in the first place. And that gets in, you know, we then start having to talk about sort of compensation, who pays and, uh, and everything else. So yeah, I mean, I think that, the good news is that uh, the you know the the true cost of uh, electricity from uh, industrial scale solar and wind is cheaper than uh, than gas, and we really need to ensure that uh, um, we make the decisions that uh, are the best both in the short term and long term for Albertans, both from an environmental perspective, but also from a cost and affordability perspective. And there is a great opportunity there, isn't there? Yeah, electricity in Alberta is an amazing opportunity. We've already exceeded uh, expectations in terms of uh, um, having a grid that was heavily dependent on coal just five or six years ago to one that's going to be fully phased out of coal by 2023. Unfortunately, a lot of that uh, um, uh, electricity is being replaced by natural gas, and that's unnecessary. We've seen such phenomenal growth in uh, uh, solar and wind, the costs of those continue to, uh, to to come down, and we really have the opportunity to be more ambitious in terms of the rate at which we transition to a 100% uh, zero emission grid. So we made some specific recommendations in our report, uh, work with the federal government and uh, other provinces to build out uh, transmission across the country, commit to a net zero grid by uh, uh, 2035. And obviously we can continue to use uh, uh, gas as long as we can capture those carbon emissions, but we should ensure that uh, any growth of electricity is met through re renewable sources. Great, and do you have anything you haven't told me about the potential, the economic potential? Like what are the economic benefits of diversifying our approach? Like I find it immensely frustrating that we seem so, you know, either this or either that, and, and we can't seem to have an integrated strategy. Yeah, I mean, Albertans support diversification. I think they're tired of the roller coaster associated with uh, oil and gas revenue. And it just makes uh, it just makes sense as well, because the, the biggest growth areas are in uh, these clean energy areas. We're obviously going, going to continue to have the oil and gas in Alberta, of course, and there are significant opportunities for jobs and investments through the decarbonization of that uh, oil and gas. But uh, we need to, you know, we need to focus on the clean energy revolution as uh, an opportunity for Alberta to really reinvent itself as a clean energy leader, not just uh, an oil and gas leader. Well said. Anything else, Simon? I think you've exhausted my uh, perspectives on this. Thanks, uh, thanks, Dave. As more extreme fires, floods, and weather threaten our towns, cities, and ecosystems, we are literally compelled to build more resilient infrastructure and avoid as many of the impacts of climate change as possible. Indeed, policies around the world and global investment are finally responding to climate change, and it's very clear that the energy economy of the future will not resemble that of the past. The transition to a more sustainable energy economy is already locked in. The key question is how to play a responsible role with traditional fossil fuel resources and build the clean energy economy of the future at the same time. The Pathways Report helps us understand the challenges and begin to plan a way forward. And there is incredible potential in embracing the new energy economy. The billions that will be spent on clean energy will get us cheaper energy, and investments in net zero buildings will future-proof us against energy insecurity and save us all money. And all of these things will create scores of jobs in new sustainable industries. You will find a link to the Pathways Report at greenenergyfutures.ca. Thanks to Simon Dyer for speaking with us in this special long-form interview. Thanks for listening. For Green Energy Futures, I'm David Dodge.